Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Music for All Patterns for Success webinar that we've been doing each Wednesday at four o'clock. Uh, my name is Bobby Lambert. I'm director of bands at Wando High School in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, where it is just an absolutely gorgeous day here uh, in our lovely state. And I'm joined today with a dear friend of mine, Mr. Taylor Watts, who's going to be talking to you a little bit later on. Those of you who don't know him, he's an assistant band director at Kell High School in Cobb County, Georgia, and has done leadership training all over the country, uh, teaches with us at the Summer Symposium, is just a, an incredible resource. And I'll talk more about him in just a second, but I want to make sure I introduce Cecily Yoakum is with us again. She's our grand uh, technology master here, controlling all of our uh, our, our stuff coming to you. So thank you, Cecily, for putting out the information to make this possible and for helping us to make this go. And then, of course, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we have our wonderful Wando drum majors. Uh, Anna, Audrey, Caroline, and Gavin are here. Anna is a senior, and the other three are juniors, so I get the pleasure of having them come back again next year. Uh, and we're kind of in the midst of drum major auditions and leadership uh, auditions and interviews and all that good stuff right now so I bet many of you are too uh, and so we've been talking in the previous episodes if you haven't seen those yet you can go to the music for all side in the educational resources section and see they're, they're being uploaded slowly so they'll be there if they're not there already and check out some of the the webinars that are about particularly audition materials and getting yourself ready uh, in next week uh, one week exactly from today and right now we'll have Koji Mori who is also a, a band, or an, an orchestra director from Cobb County, Georgia. He is the director of orchestras at Harrison High School down there. He is a former DCI drum major with uh, Phantom Regiment, famous for his Spartacus show of several years ago. If you haven't seen that, go check that out. One, an incredibly passionate conductor and teacher. And so we'll be talking next week about some more conducting specific topics. But this week, we wanted to hit something for all student leaders about um, communication. If you remember from uh, two episodes ago, we talked about the three facets of student leadership. One being character, the second being content, how well you will perform and play, and the third being communication. I purposefully left a lot of gaps in that communication sequence because I knew that we were bringing on Mr. Watts today. So we're gonna start with kind of a three-part episode. So the first part, the first 20 minutes, is going to be devoted to just foundations of communication. We know that many of you are wanting to ask questions about conflicts and specific conflicts, and we're going to get to that in the second block, the second 20 minutes, and we'll even open it up then to allow you to ask some questions. The drum majors are here to help us kind of uh, funnel those questions to Taylor. And so the last 20 minutes will be devoted to specifically that. So without further ado, hopefully everybody's in now. Uh, we can get started. I'm going to let Taylor introduce himself just a little bit more, kind of tell his history about, uh, you know, where he was leading before and some, some experiences he's had. And we'll jump right into the foundations of communication. So Mr. Watts, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, First off, thank you so much for, for coming and watching this and being a part of this. And thank you guys for inviting me on board. I'm just super excited to be here. Um, my name is Taylor Watts. Um, I am currently the Associate Director of Bands at Hell High School in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, before that, I went to the University of Georgia. I was drum major for three years there. Uh, before that, I did uh, the drum major. I was really fortunate to get a chance to be drum major of the 2009 BOA um, Tournament of Roses Band, Honor Band. Um, before that, I was a drum major at three, for three years, actually at Harrison High School, where Koji now teaches. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of opportunities to learn from and see some pretty fantastic educators and, and leadership specialists in my time. Um, getting to be a leadership team member so young gave me an opportunity to see a lot of really fantastic stuff. And I know how much that changed my life when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, and how much has continued to shape what I want to do as an adult. So um, all of the leadership stuff that I've been able to do in the last seven, 10 years or so is kind of evolved from that, just been sharing the knowledge that I've had the opportunity to gain from others and maybe a little bit of the wisdom that I've come to uh, learn from my own mistakes and mishaps. So yeah, that's me. So Taylor, we. I know one of the things that you focus on, uh, for those of you who don't know, we, when I hire a leadership consultant, I bring in Taylor to work with us at Wando. 
And one of the things that I know we wanted to talk about uh, is kind of the intentionality of communication and, and some of those things. When you start talking with maybe newer student leaders about communication, where are some of the places that you start? What are some of those foundational exercises or ideas that need to be in place? So that's, that's one of the tricky parts about doing this on a webinar um, that we've been trying to figure out is the very first thing that I, I like to do anytime that I get together and talk with aspiring leaders, whether those be kids at Kell or any of the camps that I teach or any of the bands that I work with, is trying to get, get you out of your own head and thinking about what the people around you are thinking, what the people around you are needing, what the people around you are feeling. Because um, at the end of the day, you have been focused on building yourself for most of your life. And we kind of live in a society that demands that. Um, we put you in sports at a young age and tell you to be competitive. And then we, in elementary school, track you into target classes and normal classes. And it, you get to be in band, but right away we put you in chairs. And we live in this highly competitive society where people are kind of brought up to think about how can I maximize my time or how can I maximize my effort? And the, the main trick about leadership is that you have to kind of turn that part of your brain off and start thinking about all of the people around you and how and that part of their brain in their head. Um, so one of the places I really like to start, this is kind of the thing that first inspired me when I was about 14, actually at MFA Summer Symposium um, several, several years ago. Um, was a, a little psychologist named um, Abraham Maslow and his triangle uh, hierarchy of needs. Uh, Mr. Lambert, if you're able to pull that up. This is just kind of where I like to start when, when I'm talking about it um, from a standpoint of helping people understand like what's going on in people's brains. So that base level of Maslow's hierarchy, if you've studied this before, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. If you haven't, this, is, this was revolutionary for me. Um, at the base level of anybody's hierarchy of needs are those physiological or biological needs. So you need food, you need water, you need oxygen, you need warmth, and you need sleep. If you go for any length of time without one of those things, you are going to be dead. Um, so none of the other things in your life can matter as much as that base level of need. So um, a lot of the times when you know you are hungry or you haven't eaten or you didn't get good sleep and you're not making decisions that are in your best interest or other people's best interests, um, we, we will jump to conclusions about, oh, well, this is part of our personality or this is, they're just being rude or they never liked me anyway, when in reality, sometimes it's just that that basic level of need wasn't met either for you or for them or maybe for both. Um, the need above that, the level is safety needs or the need to feel safe and secure in your environment. Like I, I think if you're on this webinar, you're probably engaged and you are devoted to learning your craft better and you want to impact other people like people before you have impacted you. But if all of a sudden your house caught on fire, you probably wouldn't stay on this, this webinar with me. Even if my house also caught on fire and I valiantly continue teaching, you'd probably prioritize your safety, getting out of the house before you prioritize getting any information. So it's, it's things like this in this hierarchy that when you, when you learn to look at why people are making the decisions that they're making or doing the things that they're doing, you can learn to forgive, you can learn to perceive instead of immediately reacting or immediately judging somebody based on just a, a single action or a single word. Um, the level above that, the belongingness and love needs, this is where we all sit frequently, especially in high school, middle school, um, but even as adults going into a situation for the first time and trying to interact socially with people, the need to feel like you're connected with other individuals. Um, once upon a time, you know, like a single, a single human being with no tools versus any large predatory animal, like we're not going to be highly successful in that combative situation. So we learn to work together in teams, in in packs, um, like like a lot of the other animal species, like wolves. Um, we, we interact in packs. The need to be a part of a group and to feel safe and to feel like I can trust the people around me is really, really important to us. So that's a level of need that we try to, try to meet as often as possible. Um, you'll notice though, like that level of need is up on the third level of the pyramid. So down in physiological needs, if something were to happen where you didn't get a lot of sleep the previous night because you were studying or because you had an issue with your family at home, or maybe you just woke up really late and you didn't get a chance to eat something and you get to school and somebody like makes a comment at you that 
is totally innocuous, totally not threatening. But sometimes we end up reacting in an aggressive way or in a defensive way or in a snotty or sn snide or sarcastic way. And you look back at that situation, you're like, that's not me. Why did I do that? And the whole reason is if you look at this pyramid and how, how things prioritize themselves inside your brain, if your base level of needs aren't taken care of, it's hard to interact with other people. Our brains don't prioritize, oh, well, I'm gonna do what's socially useful to me if the base level of needs I'm at. And other people work like that too. The level above that, the esteem needs, uh, these are the kinds of needs that are met when you feel like you have a purpose, like the needs that are met when you feel like things that you do actually have an impact on the world around you. Um, it's, it's like, I, I usually use this example in person, so it's a little less personal over, over a speaker, but like if I were to say to Mr. Lambert, I really appreciate all the mentorship that you've provided me in the last several years. Um, it's as a young professional doing something that doesn't really have a blueprint, like leadership speaking, it's been really nice to have somebody who's devoted to helping me improve and giving me opportunities like this speaking to you guys or like coming on board with MFA at the DMI, those are opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten without you. And I really appreciate that and the personal time that you take outside of those camps to keep up our relationship. That means something to me. And, and it's nice to have somebody genuine like you that's willing to invest in the people that are watching this webinar with your drum majors with me. I, I appreciate that about you. Um, and that's all kind of weird and it sounds scripted when you do it over a webinar, but those are things I genuinely think about him. Now, does that help him in terms of like being an animal and surviving in the world? Not really. I hope it makes him feel good because he deserves to feel good for those things, but it doesn't really help you survive. And yet that is a level of need that every single human being shares all the time and we don't often address it. Um, we forget to tell people how much they mean to us. We forget to say, hey, um, I really appreciate Caroline, how many times that I recall in those sessions at, at Wando and at DMI, when you would make direct eye contact with me and you'd sit really close up front. And every time I got nervous about the things that I was saying, I remember when you would look up and nod or smile or react in some way to give me that fact, that energy. Like, we forget to say that, even though that's an important part about building those relationships with other people. Um, it's, it's amazing when, you're, when a primary focus for you is making other people around you feel good, how other people will want to spend more time with you. That's kind of part of the equation. And in that, I think that's really important to, to note. Like I think some of the folks that may be freshmen or sophomores that are on here, underestimate the power that you have just in a smile and a nod and and for for us adults who have been doing this for a long time it, just your positive reinforcement of us in front of you is a really big deal so even when it's you know that that director kind of you know trying to say something just the way that you look at them and give that personal feedback of yes i understand or i'm not quite sure but i'm going to listen is huge it's it's such a big deal you can't underestimate the power of your leadership skills even when you're not saying anything especially when you're not saying anything it's enormous no question um, body language is a huge part of this and it's very very hard to do over a webinar but if you've ever conducted or you've ever watched a conductor or if you're looking at my face right now um, when i talk to my friends i don't uh just sit here and talk with a very blank expression on my face. I, I generally over exaggerate a lot of things uh, facially or I try to keep my arms open instead of closed or I try not to hunch or I try not to cover my mouth. There's so many small things that we don't really think about, but it's as Mr. Lambert was talking about in terms of intentionality, um, when you start getting in the heads of the people around you, it's really, really important that you start thinking about how am how are the things that I'm doing affecting the people around me? And that's that top level of the pyramid. Maslow's self-actualization talks about achieving one's full potential or including uh, or reaching one's purpose in life or fulfilling the thing that only you can. But at least at our stage of like peer leadership, I think it's really simple. Like we've talked about your triangle and filling your, your physiological needs, your safety needs, your biological needs, your self-esteem needs. But then once your triangle is filled, the whole point of leadership is to then pour yourself out into other people in their triangles, to be thinking, okay, 
that kid snapped at me when I asked him to do something on the field, but why? It's not because he's a jerk. It's not because he doesn't care. Um, it's probably because something is not being met. Maybe he doesn't feel like we have a strong relationship. Maybe we don't. Maybe it's that he doesn't feel safe getting criticism in front of the rest of the group because he has a, a, a lot of internal doubt about his ability to march and play or his ability to memorize dots or uh, or maybe it's as simple as I didn't have food at my house this morning my situation's a little bit rougher than than a lot of people around me and and I'm just my brain isn't thinking about all the things that you want me thinking about right now so when you start thinking about what other people are thinking and feeling and then acting intentionally in their interest um, that's when people will start respecting, listening, caring. There's an old adage that nobody know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And it couldn't be truer. Um, you can have all the information in the world. I mean, anything that we're gonna talk about on this webinar today is already on a YouTube video somewhere else or is already in a book. Things aren't crazy new, but we're not going out to seek it from people we don't know. We're impacted by the people that we do that make intentional choices on our behalf to benefit us. So I think that's, that's where to start. That, that all of those, all of those things are kind of the, the 30,000 foot view of communication. Okay. And it's really important that we start there. I know that that's a lot of information, but it's, it's for me crucial that, that folks understand. And I'm, I'm talking about from seventh grade on, uh, I, I talk about this with my, my fifth grader, my oldest daughter, um, about how you have to be aware of other people and understanding that, you know, there is the thing about here are the facts of the situation and then here are the reactions of the situation. And sometimes those don't line up. Uh, you can have people in your group or you can have a thing, well, you know, the director, we can tell when, when they're mad because this happens. And we know not to do this when they're angry. And we know that it's okay to do this when they're okay. Like my drum majors are even kind of grinning a little bit. I'm sure they, they I, I'm a terrible poker player. So I'm sure that I have my tells of what, you know, how, how I'm feeling. But the point of going through this Maslow thing is, I think sometimes we as directors get put in the place of where like, okay, we make a mistake or we lose our temper. And I've seen kids like, okay, well then I'm shutting down forever. How dare you do that to me? I think it's, it's silly for any of us to think that we can be calm and cool and collected all the time, every day. I, I know I can't do that. My kids can't do that. My students can't do that. So I think one of the first things that we would start with is to say that, you know, communication with adults, you need to come from a place of we're all humans. Right. We're all humans. And there's a right time and a wrong time. And we want to give you some ideas about how do you figure that out? But then once it's the right time, how do you approach an adult? And then then we'll segue into how do I talk with students that are older than me, students that may sit a higher chair than me. You know, he's talking about the competition side of that. Whether we like it or not, many bands have that kind of pecking order of it's seniors, then it's this group, and then it's that. And how do we navigate those waters? So let's start particularly, Taylor, with um, you want to go in and talk to your director about maybe some kind of leadership project you want to do or some, you know, let's, let's keep it positive at first. Mm -hmm. How do people do that? What's the right way to approach and communicate with adults? And it, how is that different from young people? Oh man, it's, it's a great question. And, and I think to highlight, focus in on like treat everybody as human because everyone is human. Um, I think that's one of the things that we miss a lot of times, especially at a young age. Like you go in and you're, you're talking to your director and, Oh, it's the director, but that director is human. That director was your age once. That director only makes decisions based on what they know and what they can perceive as a person. Um, and, and I think approaching it like that is important. I think sometimes people can go in, like you have a great idea, and you go into your director and people will go, hey, uh, Mr. Watts, I just think that things aren't going well around here in regards to this. People just are mean to each other, and I think we should fix it by doing this. Um, and, and right away, it's easy for somebody like me, a, a director who's in charge of the program to go, whoa, 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 P things aren't going well here. And to be defensive right away because the program is a reflection of my leadership in a lot of ways. Um, so leading with that, like that, uh, the negative or the aggressive or the, or the, um, the thing that needs to be fixed right away, sometimes we'll put people on the back foot versus saying, hey, Mr. Watts, 
check this out. I have this awesome idea. I want to institute this brother, big brother, big sister program because right now I feel like um, some, some of the freshmen are getting left out. And I think the way that we could kind of improve their experience is by maybe hooking them up with somebody initially so that they have a point of contact and somebody older than them is watching out for them. Even though descriptively we're saying the same thing, we're still saying something in your program could be different or could be better or check out this idea, the way you're approaching it and not it, but the way you're approaching him, the way you're approaching your director, the person that you're communicating with is, um, Hey, I have this idea that I think is awesome for us because I want to make everything that we do together better instead of, you know, I just think this is a problem here and starting putting the person on the defensive. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So the idea of trying to keep things, um, either positive or professional that's kind of mm -hmm. where that where the range is you know if it can't be positive it can at least be professional where we deal with facts or things rather than people just that mm -hmm. idea of this stinks about the program saying or, or this kid this kid is a problem saying mm -hmm. okay we, we have a problem with this we have a problem with respecting leadership and i have an idea the other side that you you know uh, you know, keep it professional to positive. But the other side that I liked of what you said of that was, here's my solution. Right. Um, I think as a director, when people come in to just complain, um, I want to listen to that, but I also don't know that I leave that meeting with a whole lot of answers. And it's something that's, I'm going to take time with. I'd much rather somebody come in and say, hey, here's, here's this issue with this facet of the program. And here's one way that I think we might could address that. I think anybody who's ever done that with me finds that I'm, I'm really on board pretty fast. If you have something that you can do to help and you're willing to do, that's a big thing. So, so keeping that positive professional idea there, but also being able to communicate solutions at the same time, uh, coming in with a complaint is it's not, you know, it's like the old, old time they used to have suggestion boxes on the, the wall. And there was an old cartoon of where it was like, just went to the incinerator. So people would drop the, the notes in there and it would just go and be burned up forever because nobody wanted to hear the complaints, but people do want to hear suggestions of how to get better. So whenever you can commit, uh, communicate with a director with a problem, go to them about here's an issue, but I think here's a solution. Or if you can't do a solution, just asking for help. Like I need your help in how to deal with something. I don't want you to deal with it. I need your help and how to do this. And I think you're going to find when we transition over to talking with peers, a lot of the same rules apply. I think the only thing that's different is maybe the language that you might use. And I'm going to have Taylor finish up this thought. I'll start it and I'll let him finish. Being concise and precise are two different things. Concise means the, sh the fewest words possible. Precise means it's the most accurate or whatever. And I know the math people are going to say, well, there's precision and there's accuracy and those are I mean, like which one is closest to true and which one is the briefest. So I like it when students have kind of thought through. I've even had students come in with a sheet of paper saying, I want to read this to you and I want to get this out correctly. And they'll read through it and say, "There's a, I, I'm having trouble with this. I need your help to figure this out. Here are the issues. And then they look at me and I'm like, okay, we can deal with that. Do you have any? My point is when you talk with a director, you have to remember that he or she is listening to all the people in their band, your parents, their administrators, their community leaders, like just tons of people. So the more direct that you can be, the cons more concise you can be, the better. So don't go in in an emotional outrage. I think that's the worst time. Like let go deal with that at a different time, a different place. I, I talk with kids, go cry in your pillow then get your thoughts together and come to me. I said that to my eight year old last night. Like she was having a meltdown because of this math online thing she was trying to do. I mean, absolute utter meltdown. And I was like, okay, go to your room and flip out all you want. I don't want to see it, but I know it needs to be done. So go do it. Then when you're ready, let's come back and let's figure out what the real problem is. So as we transition talking from uh, student or for directors to student, I'm going to let Taylor talk about that. But before I do, if you have questions, I see some of you already putting some up there, especially in regards to conflict. This next portion is going to be about peer communication. And then the last 20 minutes are going to be some answering of questions between Taylor and myself. 
So if you've got some of those, maybe go ahead and start thinking about them, formulating them now and putting them up on the question and answers. The drum majors will be answering and collecting like we had several of these questions. Could you address that? Okay, so Taylor, take it away. The idea of peer-to-peer -peer communication, what are the similarities with the adults? What are the differences and how do we approach that? Sure, well, I, I, think, I think you actually segued into it really nicely from when you were talking about coming in with solutions and being concise and and, but also precise. It's, it's really important, um, at least to me, when students come in with a, with a complaint or with a concern, it's really important to me that they've thought about the entire situation and not just their perspective of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had a student come in and say, I'm having an issue because I feel like this person is doing this. And the, the simple question is, well, why? Why do you think they're doing that? And if there's no answer, you're not ready to talk yet. Um, and if the answers are only negative, if the answers are only, well, I think they're selfish or I think they're jealous, then you haven't thought hard enough. Um, one of the things that I, I heard once upon a time that I really appreciate is that nobody is the villain in their own story. We are all our own heroes. Um, it's, and the people that, that we don't agree with at the time can sometimes be perceived as a villain and when we let ourselves perceive the other side or the other person as a villain then we almost dehumanize them we don't try to empathize or or understand their point of view and then we're we're totally at a combative place um my side is correct your side is not there's no well this is how i feel and i understand that you feel this way so how can we put these together where can we meet in the middle how can we how can we resolve and absolve each other and go forward with a relationship. Um, so that's the place to start with peers. Um, I mean, with directors, for sure, remember they're human, but with peers, you, people want to be heard. Um, and this is something that you're gonna be dealing with forever. Right now, it's peer-to-peer -peer in high school band, but one, eventually it's going to be peer-to-peer -peer in a marriage or peer-to-peer -peer in a workplace environment or peer-to-peer -peer in you name it, an organization that you're part of. And it's so important for you to be considering at all times, especially in conflict, why are they acting the way they're acting? What are they thinking? What are the motivations behind what the decisions that they're making? Um, Taylor, it's what I want to interrupt you just for a second. Sure. And ask this. Let, let's pretend that, you know, I think that all of that is working really well for folks that maybe you don't know yet, or maybe you're just starting to have a, an issue with. The next question I'm going to ask you is, I bet that there are several of our listeners that have that mortal enemy in the band, that kid that they just can't stand. Like, how do we do that? And you, you started to go there, I think. And what I was going to ask is, if we can't figure out the motivations of others, for me, I think it's okay to ask. Absolutely. Like, how, how do I approach, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with my mortal enemy right now in the band. We're the same age, we played the same instrument, and we've never liked each other since middle school. But now we're the two section leaders. Mm -hmm. Like, how do, I, how do I start building that relationship? Is relationship important? Can we just be leaders together and oblivious to each other? Like, how, how do we start to do kind of, you know, I know we're gonna get into the conflict thing a little bit, but I, I, Taylor and I got to talk yesterday and we said, if you're at conflict, you've already missed some of the communication steps. So let's pretend that, you know, we're not fighting directly, but we just don't like each other. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we start to maybe patch those fences? So th that's a great question. Very multifaceted, very difficult to deal with um, from the standpoint uh, from a couple standpoints, but primarily if you feel like you have an enemy, you need to do something right now. Um, there aren't, I, I legitimately don't feel like growing up I ever had enemies. Um, I had people I disagreed with. I had people that I didn't value the same things or that I thought their values were outside my system. Um, but if, if you've gotten to the point of enemy, there's something you need to do. Um, and I, I'm under no delusions that everyone is going to be best friends. Like, it's not a utopia. We're not all going to be best friends. We're going to have different ways to approach things and, and different views on what we think is important or how we think the best route to do something is. But if you're a section leader with somebody that you haven't seen eye to eye with in a long time, there's a couple things that probably need to happen or a couple of different ways that you can handle it. Um, the first, like he said, is you have to open a line of communication. And sometimes that's really difficult. Sometimes it can be 
you know, I, I feel like the last time we spoke, it ended really negative and they did this and they never said sorry. And I'm not going to be the first one to speak, but chances are, if you feel that way, they probably also feel that way. And if nobody's willing to take a step towards movement, towards opening a line of communication, you're, you're kind of out of luck. And I don't, I, I think anybody who's ever been part of a team with leaders who aren't on the same page and obviously aren't on the same page, you end up dealing with schisms in, in the group. Um, you'll have people that only respect this person, people that only respect this person. And I think both leaders can recognize that's not going to be in the best interest of the band. It's just not. Um, you can you can say, well, I think the people following me are right and the people following you are wrong. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's you still have a band that is not working together. And if that's something that matters to you, if all the parts about communication and working in cooperation mean something to you and you really say the things you mean in your leadership interviews, then do something about it, even if it's the hard thing. Um, so I would open a line of communication and it can be very real. It can be like, hey man, look, um, we haven't talked in years and, or every time we talk, like it's aggressive or I feel like, you know, I, every time I see you be successful or, or yeah, I go out for a chair test, like I want you to fail. And I think that's a problem. I, I don't want to feel that way about you. And I don't want that to be something that, um, that we experience together. We're going to spend the year together and the band is either going to grow or wither um, with us. So I think it's important that we sit down and chat. And um, I think being open and honest about the things that you're feeling, but the things that you've done to hurt them is also really important. Um, I think that's one of the strongest components of conflict resolution that you can possibly reach is I, I realized that I did this thing and you probably felt this way about it. And I'm really sorry. Um, if you start with all the things that they've done that have hurt your feelings, they're already on the defensive. They have already shut down to everything that you're going to say, even if it's in, even if it's in kindness or trying to repair the relationship, they, they shut down. So start in the hard place, start in, I've been wrong. Start in, I've hurt you. Start in, I'm really sorry that this has happened. Um, we split ways and never talked and I never reached out and that's on me and I wanna fix that. Um, so that's, that's where I would start. Now, I mean, sometimes you are going to be in charge of an organization with somebody that you don't see things the same way as or you don't want to do things the same way. And I think in, in those terms, you need an open line of communication, but sometimes it's important to, to delegate tasks to say, you know, I think you're really strong at this and I'm really strong at this. Um, maybe this is where we start right now since we can't really see eye to eye and you kind of be the, the main point of, of, of reference here. And I'll defer to you, even when I don't agree with you, I'll support you. Um, and maybe you can do that for the same for me over here and over time, supporting each other in public and disagreeing only in private, you'll start building up that rapport. And maybe you'll even start to see that the, the way they view things is, is working in a way that you wouldn't have expected. Um, or maybe it doesn't, and maybe they see that and they come back to you for help or advice or assistance. But supporting each other in public and then disagreeing in private is an important component there. And then sometimes you need to be able to talk to to people as intermediaries. Um, sometimes you're in a place where you don't have very a very good relationship with somebody, but it's still important that you have good rapport or influence with them. And sometimes that's talking to somebody else. Um, I've definitely, as, as a high school student, I had a, a soft, I was a sophomore drum major and I had a sousaphone member who's a senior who no matter what I did was not going to respect me or listen to me when, when I had a problem or when the band directors asked me to do something. So instead of dealing with him on a one-on-one -on -one basis, a lot of the times I I had already befriended the tuba section leader. And whenever I had an issue with the tuba player, I would go talk to the sousaphone section leader and say, hey man, um, I'm really having a hard time. The directors want me to talk to him about this, but I don't think he's gonna hear it coming from me. Would you mind maybe touching base with him since you guys have a relationship? And that kind of triangulation strategy is, a, is another way, but don't ever get to the point of, well, there's just nothing I can do. The second you throw up your hands in conflict, you're right, there is no solution. Um, right. You have to be willing to keep trying and you can't villainize people. You have to realize that they're a human and they're doing things for something that makes sense in their own head. Well, Taylor, I want to, before we jump into the conflict resolution, conflict management, not resolution, because I think one of the things that we're going to tell you that may blow people's minds is that you may have, you may be engaged in conflict with somebody and it never resolves itself. It's just mm -hmm. simply managed. Uh, that's, that is a reality of life. 
but what I wanted to do, one of the key things that I, I missed that Taylor does, I think it's so important is let's pretend, let, let's go to an easy one now and let it, let our brains simmer on a lot of this information. You, you do a great process of meeting people for the first time. Like what does a leader do to get to know someone who they don't know before? And I've really used this. We've talked about this quite a bit at Wando about it's a great first meeting thing, but it's also great for the third and fourth meeting. And here's what we, we talk about. Like in our ensemble, we're large enough to where you could be in the same section with someone and not really know them. You know, we talk about, do you know their middle names? Do you know their favorite sport? Do you know their favorite hobby? And if you don't know those things, they are not important to you. You can say they are, but that's, you're, you're full of it. That's just not, that's not what it is. So he has a great way of, of, you know, almost a step-by-step -step process of how do you get to know someone? And so before we jump into the conflict real seriously, mm -hmm. uh, Taylor, do you mind going through that with everybody? Sure. It's, it's kind of hard to do on a webinar. Um, it's going to sound, I mean, I guess I sound like I've been preaching at you the whole time. So sorry about that. No. Um, but yeah, so it's a it's kind of a conversation schema that I made up just to kind of think about how people develop relationships. Um, a lot of people will say, hey, what's your name? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm Taylor. Okay, cool. What do you play? Okay, cool. Uh, what age are you? Okay, what what's your favorite color? And they, they kind of get in this loop of like single questions that have single answers they don't tell you much about a human being. I call that level of relationship building, that top level exposition. It's important to know, because um, I think we've all had that experience where we've met somebody and then we accidentally forgot their name. <laughs> and then we kind of promptly avoid them every single time that we see them in high school um, because we don't want them to find out that we don't know their name. And, and as silly as that is, it's something that we can all relate to as humans. But exposition is important from the standpoint of if I don't know your name, like you said, um, then you're obviously not important to me. So it's important to ask, you know, hey man, what's your name? Oh, cool, it's, it's really nice. My name's Taylor, um, it's good to meet you. I'm one of the drum majors here. But then right away, I like to jump into the second level of relationship building. Instead of asking preferential questions or informational questions like, you know, do you have any siblings? Or what's your favorite color? Or what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Where people go to, which doesn't really tell you much. I like to go to interests. I like to say, hey man, how do, how do you spend your time outside of band? What do you do when you're not in this room? Because that'll tell you a lot about how people spend their time is what they're interested in, what they care about, and, and um, what's important to them. So if you can get them saying, even as much as, well, I like to play video games. You can say, oh, cool, you play video games? Well, what kind of games do you play? They're like, uh, I don't know, right now, um, I'm, I'm kind of into Super Smash Bros. And then you can go, oh, well, cool. If you know about Super Smash Bros, the questions are easy. The questions are, oh, well, who's your main? Oh, do you, do you, oh, cool. So you main, you main you two? Well, that's a little out of meta right now. And you can actually go into follow-up questions about the specific subject. But a lot of people, when they say video games and you're not a gamer, you go, okay, cool. Well, what else? And then you effectively accidentally told them, what you're interested in is not interesting to me, so I don't care. And it's, it's such an easy, it's called a conversational pivot. Um, it's such an easy thing to avoid. If you don't know anything about video games, simply ask a follow-up question that's, oh, well, that's cool, man. I don't really play a lot of games. What do you play? What are you into? And then when they tell you Super Smash Bros, you're like, I've never even heard of it. What is that game? And then all of a sudden, you're digging into who they are as a person, what they care about, what they're interested in, and you'll get to questions that they have to give you answers that aren't single word. And then all of a sudden in conversation, they are talking, you're listening instead of you talking, trying to get them to talk. And they, you'll walk away from that conversation. A lot of times they don't know a thing about you, but they feel listened to and they feel heard for the first time, sometimes in the entire band camp or the entire season or the entire high school experience. And they'll want to come back to you so that you can give them more of that feeling of intimacy and that you care about them. Um, and like you were saying, you have to remember. I mean, you have to earnestly care about people. It can't be conversation for conversation's sake. You want to get to know this person. And then next time you see them, be like, hey, man, how's Super Smash Bros going? Hey, are you going to any tournaments? And follow up. Um, that's, that's at the basic level, you move from exposition to interests. Um, I, think and so I think it's so important, the thing that you were saying about 
how don't don't just I mean it's okay to ask like what's your favorite ice cream or whatever if that's going to mean something to you if it's like oh I like chocolate too let's let's go get ice cream. like if you're going to do something with it then that's okay but I think it's so important that you're saying about it it's about getting to know them you know we sometimes will think as leaders it's a it's a two-way street they feed me I feed no especially in the first rehearsals new I always get this answer when I ask the leaders how are the new kids uh they were kind of weird it was sort of yeah they're incredibly self aware and and selfish if you mean selfish in I have nothing to give right now that their attendance is the get the only gift that they have to give as a first time member and you have to know that and not not see it as well they just didn't talk very much well neither did you your first year here uh, I, I've seen so many people go through the transition of we had to beg them to get out of their mom and dad's car to come to the first rehearsal. And then they end up being some of our most vocal leaders uh, with stuff as it goes through. You have to be, as you move to that leader, tra that leadership section, that leadership strata, I guess, you, if you will, you have to remember what it's like for people just starting. They are not going to give answers freely. They're not going to, it'll look like they don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. But they really do. They don't know how to show that any other way. I remember my first day of band camp. All of these folks here remember their first days of the high school rehearsal. And it, it can be brutal. It can just be brutal. So if you're looking at going into leadership because you want to feel more fulfilled about yourself, it will happen, but not directly. Not direct. No one's going to come to you and go, wow, you're the best. Let me give you a five-minute exposition of why you were an incredible leader. You might get a letter at some point. You might have somebody say, yeah, I really appreciated getting to know you this year. If, if they're small little bundles of that, but they mean so much. And I just, I, I always warn leaders, potential leaders, that if one of two things, number one, if you say, I am too shy to talk to anybody else, this may not be where you are at right now. That may be where you need to focus for a little while, getting used to speaking to others. Or two, if you're saying, well, I think I'm going to, you know, if I don't become a leader, I'm going to quit band. You should quit today. That, that's not what this is because it's going to be hard. It's going to be really, I think we think that leadership is a position that elevates me above everybody else. It's something that I'm aspiring to. Well, I'm aspiring to it so that I can give things away and so that I can lower and diminish my own person and try and give of myself to other people. That's the true aspect of leadership that I think sometimes is missed by people. And you can say, oh, well, they say that, but you get all these privileges. You know, there are some privileges that come with leadership, but the amount of responsibility that comes with those is way greater. It's sort of like, well, I'll give you $10, but now you have to do three days labor for that. Yeah, sure enough, you get the $10, but that three days labor, it, it's not an even trade-off. I know these guys, I don't give them enough to do all the leadership stuff that they do. I mean, uh, you know, they're making zeros of dollars right now to come and work with us doing this, but they do that because they love to give of themselves and, and help out. So if I think maybe one of the places we should kind of stop and look before we jump into conflict management is why do I really want to be a leader? Maybe you're a great person who's also a great player but you hate talking to other people. I think you've got to address that. And I've seen, we have leaders all the time that have trouble speaking, but they learn to, to get into that role and it helps them out a lot when audition and interview times come. But if you're the person that's like, well, I'm wanting to get leadership for me. I want something out of the, the process. I, I think you're gonna be sorely disappointed and get really jaded really quickly. If that is you, if you're a person that's like, well, I'm bored with band, I wanna try something different, um, I would say, why are you bored? What are you bringing to the table? What are you making better? Maybe forget about a leadership position and just be a leader. Like I'm, I wanna start, like we were talking about that uh, older brothers, older sisters, we've done a ride share program at Wando with certain sections that people have handled beautifully. We've done individual lessons and master classes, student to student, like maybe that's what you want to do. But 
I think now before you get into the nuts and bolts of conflict management, because it's hard, it, you have to really swallow your pride and, and you, you have to humble yourself down. The only way that you can do that is if you earnestly feel like I want to be a leader to help our program and help its people. If that's not part of your motivation, um, this is going to be really rough. It's going to be really rough. So with that being said, we're going to, we're going to jump. I'm going to give Taylor just a little bit of time to do some of the conflict. I mean, we've done a lot of the con conflict uh, management again, not resolution, but just management. And I'll let him talk a little bit about that, but then we'll go right to the drum majors and ask what are some questions that you're getting that you'd like for Taylor to address to everybody. Taylor, uh, you know, let's go to the worst possible scenario. We've had a broken relationship in the group. And let's even not be a part of that. Let's say that it's these, a drum major and a section leader are no longer deeply in love. And I am a fellow section leader. How do I navigate some of those waters? What are, the communicate, what are some of the communication skills or what are some of the schema I need to put together to try and do this? And I don't know if they're, you know, it's rough. It's really rough. But I think some of those are the most negative communication examples that we that i've seen sure well it's it's rough from that specific standpoint because at the end of the day the only people that can manage a conflict are the people that are in the conflict um and a lot of the time it, it being on the outside it's hard <laughs> it, it's it's hard a couple of things you want to prevent the individual conflict from becoming a group conflict in that particular instance um and the only way to do that in in a small band it's by having relationships with lots of people in a larger band sometimes it's kind of hard to to have enough influence with the individuals to to make sure that there isn't there aren't schisms forming. Um, but in that particular instance, I think it's important, especially in like a romantic breakup, which are so hard at, 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 we always, we always, as people go, oh, high school romances, middle school romances, but even as adults, romances, marriages and divorces are still the hardest things. So I try not to uh, diminish, like I, it's part of the human experience and one of the toughest things to navigate. Um, but in one of those situations, I think the best thing that you could do as somebody that's not in that situation is to listen to people. They need to be able to vent. The section leader needs to be able to say all the terrible things that they feel about the drum major that, that they had an issue with and why this all happened. But in, in after moments of hurt, after moments of aggression, after moments of frustration, sometimes it's important to say, okay, I, I hear that all of that is is happening and I hate that you experienced that. That is really terrible. But at the end of the day, like that's, that's happened and that's said and done. But a couple of things, do you want that to be the experience for the rest of the year? Is you thinking about that instead of thinking about all of these people that are looking to you still for guidance, for, for inspiration, for influence, for any of those things. All of, all of you being wrapped up in the romantic uh, breakup is kind of impacting your ability to positively impact the people that you got in this position to do. Um, so it's okay to feel all of those feelings about uh, the frustrations, but I wouldn't let that be the primary part of your personality. I wouldn't let that seep into other people. And just kind of drawing people's brains away from their away from their own thought processes and into well think about the other thought processes that you're influencing is important um and then making sure that you're communicating with both parties um, both parties are going to be frustrated with each other um but if if you can bring them a to the realization that their feelings are okay b to the realization that they don't want them they don't want those feelings to be the overriding factor of the rest of their season or the rest of their time in band with the the legacy that they leave is this nasty spat that they had. Um, and then third, eventually, if you can help them realize that there was a, there's a reason that this happened, it wasn't, you know, like maybe it's just an incompatibility or maybe the other person isn't this terrible person. Maybe we just weren't ready to communicate in a specific way in a relationship. de, de in other way, in other words, the, the other person so that you can still work together towards the same common goal. You know, there's a great, great saying that a few people have used of keep the main thing, the main thing. 
And the main reason that our bands exist are to bring people together to make great music. And if, if that gets diminished by a relationship, lack of relationship, um, individual, then we have to address that for sure. And so I think, you know, putting this all together, it's number one, what are your motivations? Is this about band or is this about a title or a privilege? Two, how far are you willing to open yourself up to communication, like getting to know other people? How important are they to you? Um, and, and how best can you address them? And then the other part of it is being able to de-villainize. I think that's one of the best ways I've ever heard say that. Uh, it's not me against you. We are in band. And our ultimate goal should be to make this great. Now, that may mean that you and I stay on opposite sides of the field. We don't ride the bus together. We're not BFFs. I think that's one of the things I would tell students is it's okay that if you're not friends, but you have to be friendly or professional, however you best want to say that. And I would tell you that wasting time with uh, those kinds of things like, well, this person did this in fifth grade and so I hate them now, or this person has done this. I, I, you know, sometimes it's just, we agree to disagree. They'll do their thing, I'll do mine. Usually that works until we're in a section together and we have to kind of work those things out. So when you are there, it may be a, let me go talk to a director, let them know, we, here's a situation. How can I best influence the two of them? At the end of the day, if your efforts are going nowhere, you need to get a director involved because it's affecting a lot of other people. And you're not asking them to fix it, but again, you're being concise and precise. Drum major A and section leader B were together, now they're not, and we're causing a lot of rifts. I want to try and influence that positively how can I help? And you say that to Mr. and Mrs. Band Director and they give you some thoughts. That, because letting it fester, the longer it festers, uh, the worse it gets. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, drum majors, my friends here, uh, are there any questions that you wanna throw up to Taylor real quick so that we can do, I've seen a couple of them on here if you guys need a little bit more time, but. Do any one of you have one of the questions from the question and answer section that you want to throw at, at Taylor real quick? Uh, oh, we were course. receiving a lot of questions about how drum majors and leaders should react when there's a conflict in the band regarding respect from students towards adults or other leaders. So I bet that's a thing where uh, there's maybe a staff member or a director that they feel like the kids aren't respecting like, how do they help them to do that? Right. So that's, that's an interesting question and a tricky one. Um, uh, if, if a lot of teachers will, especially in their first couple of years of teaching, they'll have somebody challenge them and then, hey, can we all do this? And somebody goes, no. And, and in that situation, there's like a direct conflict with somebody that's being disrespectful to you inordinately. And your first reaction is to be defensive and to try to be authoritative and to be like, well, I'm the director. I said, you have to do this. But at the end of the day, everyone is human. I can't force a student or another person to do anything. I can provide consequences or punishments if they don't. But at the end of the day, if you don't put your instrument on your face and play, I can't make you do that. Um, so I think part of it is understanding like that you buy respect and you buy influence with people with the time, the effort and the resources that you invest into them. Um, the more time that you've invested in someone, the more um, you have gone out of your way and and given to them in terms of effort or the more resource that you've invested in them. I mean, I have kids that I've given reads to because they couldn't afford reads at some point in their life. And the, the, the respect that you buy only through your investment is really important. Um, in that moment, yeah, like there are some awkward times where people will just um, be obstinate be like aggressively disrespectful. And to be honest with you, I think you only hurt yourself when you deal with that in the moment. You only, or, or, and or if you deal with it publicly. If I have a student that's being obstinate, I'm never going to talk to them about it in front of the ensemble. I'd be like, all right, um, would you mind going and sitting in the office? Because obviously you don't feel like doing this. I have to pay attention to the other 70 people in this classroom right now. We have something we want, need to work out. Let's do it later. 
Um, and, and I would say it's something like that. I know that sounds superficial, but I really try to treat my, my, my students as humans um, rather than as subordinates. Because the second you go, go to my office, we'll talk about this later. What if they say no to that? Because you were disrespectful in turn to their disrespect. You're going to call the administration? Like just approaching people as human and saying, look, this isn't working right now and, and dealing with it off the field. Um, and I think in a situation where like you're a section leader and someone's disrespectful to a staff member, let them handle it in the moment. I think you kind of jumping on, hey man, be cool. Maybe, maybe not the most necessary thing in the moment because then you kind of cut the staff member off from reacting their own way. But I think it would be totally appropriate afterwards to be like, hey man, that was, um, that was a little hot. Did you, did you mean to come across like that? Because I, that was, that was aggressive. It was really awkward for everyone. Um, and just kind of being real with th telling them the experience that they created for other people. L like Mr. Lambert was saying, the, the whole game here is to be thinking about what other people are thinking. And if you can draw other people's free, uh, um, awareness to the impact that they are having on the people around them, uh, sometimes that's as much as you have to do. Final layer I would say to that, because I've experienced this a couple of times, is if there's a staff member that maybe when they're trying to run things, it's not working very well and you've tried to be patient with it for a little while, that's when it's go to a director and let them know that, hey, we're, I'm, I'm, ha I'm having trouble keeping everybody's focus and attention with said staff member during this time. What can I do? Do you mind talking with them? I, I know they see it, but they're not quite reacting to it yet. Going to the director, don't talk to other students about it. That it's not a yeah. Don't I hate it when so and so does the warm ups. I hate it when they do the technique block. No, like stop gossip at the very beginning. Only talk to people that can affect change. Uh, you might be talking to somebody that can help you react better, or talking to a director who can impact something. Don't just talk to hear your head roar. Okay, uh, I think that that's a really good question. Uh, my other friends, do you all have a, a question that you want to share? Yes, so we have one about like having the right mindset for the band, both in concert and in marching season. So that way, how you can motivate people to basically try their hardest. Sure. Um, I think it's important. Motivation is going to differ for every human being. And a lot of people, a lot of leaders are like, why don't you care about band as much as I do? And the answer is if they cared about it as much as you do and in the same way, they would probably be in your position. Um, everyone joins band for a different reason. Some people need that social fulfillment. Um, some people just really enjoy the activity of making music. Some people need the, the kind of esteem of contributing to something bigger than themselves. Some people just like to go on trips. <laughs> the, but recognizing that everybody has their own motivation is going to help you approach people individually um, and kind of reach their need where they're at. If somebody, if somebody's like, man, band just isn't fun anymore, then I mean, I think maybe ask why. I mean, sometimes people are like, oh, well, it's not fun because like, I, I just, I feel like the seniors were really good and then they left and now it's not fun anymore. And sometimes it's like, well, I get that. But like part of the magic of being uh, uh, in your freshman year is that the people older than you are trying to create this incredible experience on your behalf instead of an experience for themselves. So maybe the issue here is like, we're not doing enough for, to create, to create the magic for them. So maybe instead of worrying about like, it's not funny more because I miss my seniors, maybe you should focus more on being the senior for the freshman that's behind you so that they can have the same feeling you did. Um, and I mean, there, there are, there are mid-season slumps. Um, every, every band hits that in September and October where you're, nothing is new, novelty has worn off. So it's not initially exciting anymore. Um, and when you're trying to motivate people, um, there's, I mean, reaching people where they're at, sometimes reminding people about the experiences that they've had and the emotional payoff that is coming at the end of the season is important. And sometimes it, it's, it's just getting them in the right place. Like there, there's times in September where we won't do a, a visual warm up. We're, we'll just play a game. We'll just do something different and, and exciting and fun and silly. I'm um, just to put people in a different headspace to declutter and de-stress so that when they're asked to do a thing, they've approached it with a new mindset. There's, there's no one size fits all to this, but don't, 
be careful about thinking, oh, well, they just don't care. Oh, well, they're not motivated. Figure out why they're doing this and, and maybe use that as part of the motivating factors. Audrey, one of the parts that I heard of that is, and it may be not where they're coming from, but I bet some might have this issue. You have some that love concert band, don't necessarily love marching band, and vice versa. And I think, you know, you all have been at Wando long enough to where we really talk about how each one feeds the other. You know, if you listen to Chris Martin, principal trumpet of the New York Philharmonic now, he's a beast and he just doesn't miss. And he'll tell you one of the reasons he's like that is because of his time with Phantom Regiment. Uh, when you hear just incredible players, you find that they can play whatever genre you want. J.D. Shaw is a fantastic horn player at the University of South Carolina, but to hear him play jazz horn is phenomenal. So I would say that helping people understand, you can't just say, well, I just like concert band and I don't like marching band. You can say maybe I don't like the physical nature of it, but you're still gaining great playing chops by doing the marching band side. So maybe that's a little bit of another way to approach that. I think we have time for one more and then we've got to wrap things up. So Caroline or Anna, which one of you is going to take us out? Caroline's got it. We had questions going back to talking about enemies, but someone was asking, how do you help others who are having enemies, not necessarily for yourself, but how do you help intervene with that conflict or do you have a director handle it? Sure. I mean, the caveat is some things are above your pay grade. Like sometimes it gets too, it gets too much or you've tried all the strategies that you can think to try and it's not working and going to the director is the right option. Um, a lot of, uh, one of the biggest mistakes you can make as, as, a, as a younger leader is to think I have to handle everything myself. Handle what you can handle. If there are things that are, are too much or that you don't feel like your efforts are helping, then yeah, feel free to go to somebody about it. Um, I mean, the, the hard part about helping other people that are in, con that are in conflict with one another um, is that you can provide, if a river is moving in a direction, you can provide a split, but you can't decide which way the water goes a lot of the time. Um, so just trying to provide a couple of things, provide an environment where people feel safe and they don't feel like it's okay to rag on each other. Um, the first time every year that somebody laughs at another student in the concert band, I, 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 I am not the positive, happy Mr. Watts. I'm pretty aggressive. Like, we don't do that, man. Like, you can't be that disrespectful to somebody because it makes it totally unsafe for everybody else, and we don't do that here. Um, so uh, being aggressive in creating a positive atmosphere um, is, is an important part so that people feel safe to, to interact with each other. Um, and then just I, a lot of the time it's taking the time to help bring their awareness to why, um, to why the other person feels that way. We've kind of talked about that. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, if I have two kids that don't like each other, I'm not going to sit them next to each other in concert band. I'm going to sit them on opposite ends of the section. Um, and, and at first that feels fake, but it's in everybody's best interest, including theirs to do that. Um, Sorry, there was one more point and I've lost it. Um, Brains are going a million miles a minute while yeah, truly. that thought. What I would say, uh, Caroline, I, I think the way to measure that, number one, see how many people is it affecting? If it's only affecting those two, uh, I would leave it alone. Honestly, like let it, let it kind of burn itself out. If it's affecting their sections or other people, I, I would say I try twice. Try two of the strategies that Taylor gave. And, and if those don't work, that's when you kind of, that's when you start, I need to move to a staff member or a director to talk about this. Cause I think sometimes people don't know, like, when should I get involved? Well, when people that you are responsible for become affected, that's when you have to get involved. You're their protector as a section leader, as, as any kind of leader, you protect them. Like you guys have seen me at a, a contest before where somebody said, uh, your, your band can't come here. You can't do this. I get angry and aggressive with students, but I get way worse with any adult who tries to stop us or tries to, or gets in our way or tries to hurt one of you. I'm like Papa Bear when that happens. So you as the leader have to be a little bit their advocate. So Taylor, I didn't mean to, to no, no. That, but, but go ahead and fit. I hope you got time to collect your thought. Yeah, thank you. The, I, and it's actually what you said. Um, 
I, some of the time when people come back to a camp for their second year and they're like, man, I've tried so hard with this and I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. I often forget to tell people not to pour themselves into people, into buckets that have holes in the bottom. Um, if you're, if you're constantly trying to pour into somebody and, and they're not at a place to receive that, um, sometimes that's, you know, they're stressed out and you're constantly giving advice. Hey, you gotta do this. Hey, you gotta do this. I really think it would help if you do this. And then the next week they come back and need the same advice because they've done the same things. Um, it's not healthy for either of you to keep in that reciprocal cycle. It's sometimes it's okay to say, look, I've tried to, to, to talk to you and to help you out with this, but I don't feel like what we've done together has really benefited. So I think maybe we need to bring somebody else in. Maybe we need to talk to a director. Maybe we need to talk to one of your, your other friends or a counselor or a teacher. Um, it's, it, it don't, I want you to feel like other people are your responsibility because that's the only way that you're going to, to care about others enough to get your, your brain space out of your own thinking and start thinking about other people. But everyone is not your responsibility and you can't make everyone's life perfect because you want to and you have information to do so. Um, it's, it's just about effort. And then when that effort doesn't work, a retransition. Well, it all goes back to what we said, you know, originally leadership at its core is about sincerity. Mm -hmm. So even if you mess up on some of these techniques, if you're sincere about trying to help other people, you'll be forgiven a good bit of that. I, I, I've seen, I, one of my best leaders of all time was this tenor saxophone player who was kind of a rough kid at Marion. And when we chose him as section leader, we actually did not choose him at the time of everyone else. We waited for the summer and into the next season to name him finally section leader because he was a goofball. I mean, he just... He just was always goofing around. We didn't think he would be serious enough. And the truth was he was never serious, but he was a phenomenal leader. He took his personality and he was sincere about taking care of his section and doing what was right and what was best for them. And he, that section bonded. They got so close and they were close for the next three years based on what he set up at that one time. So you know, I think sometimes we get into this, this idea of I've got to do everything right. No, the only thing you have to do right is to be sincere about what you're wanting to do. I truly want to help our band and its people get better and do well. And if that's at your core, the techniques can help and maybe make things go faster, but they can't replace fake. They can't replace insincerity. Mm -hmm. So that, and, and that's tough. There's some of you that are listening right now that uh, you, all, as with all of us, we have to check our conscience and say, is this really what I want? Do I need to be a better follower before I can be a better leader? And that's a really tough thing to do. Well, thank you, Taylor, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, you can actually check out Taylor's website. He has Taylor what it's tell us the, the name. Of, it's Taylor Watts Leadership, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. right? Taylor Watts Leadership. Yeah, tell what's leadership.com. You can go check out some information from him there and maybe you're at send it to your band directors, maybe to bring him out to work with us. Uh, you know, the, the quarantine will be over at some point. We don't know when, but it will be over at some point. And I got to tell you, we've actually done a, a thing with our entire band with him and it was phenomenal. And then we brought him to our contest and he's still set to come to our contest again in September. Uh, but we brought him to the contest and he's worked with different leaders from the different bands that were there and it went over incredibly well. So if you're looking for leadership guidance, that's a great guy to go to next week. We'll welcome Koji Mori to be with us. Uh, go check out that, uh, the, the Sparta, if you put in drum Corps Phantom regiment Spartacus, Oh, you'll get plenty of hits with that. You'll be able to see him, but he's going to really talk to us about some more advanced conducting techniques. And for those of you that have especially been conducting for a few years, and even some of you who have been to our camps before, we want to go to maybe another level and see what's possible. After that, we actually have Joel Denton coming in to be with us. And a dear friend of mine, Stephanie Grody, is going to be coming back. She's actually the first female uh, conductor for Santa Clara Vanguard a number of years ago. She's going to be joining us uh, with a session in the upcoming week. So a lot of cool stuff coming up in Patterns of Success. To all of our drum major friends out there, we thank you for spending your time with us. Thank you to the Wando drum majors and to Cecily for making this go and to Music for All, of course. Uh, and Taylor, once again, thanks so much for being with us, man. Can't thank, thank you. you enough. Miss Cecily, thank you very much. We'll see you all next week, four o'clock.